conversation because the matter is very serious. Situation in Donbass is becoming critical. And today I'm addressing you directly, not only to talk about what's happening, but also to inform you about the decisions we're making, about possible steps in this regard. Once again, I would like to underscore that Ukraine is not just a neighbor, neighboring country to us. It is an inherent part of our own history, culture, spiritual space. They are our comrades, relatives, not only colleagues, friends, but also our family, people we have blood and family ties with. Since ancient times, people from ancient southwestern Russian lands were called themselves, were calling themselves Russians and Orthodox. That was happening until 17th century when part of these territories rejoined the Russian Empire, the Russian state, and after that. It seems that we know all about this, that we are talking about facts that everyone knows, but at the same time we need to have understanding what is happening today to explain motives and aims that Russia has. We need to say a couple of words about the history of this matter. I would like to start by saying that the modern Ukraine is completely was completely created by Russia, to be more exact, by Bolsheviks, Bolshevik communist Russia. This process has started almost immediately after the 1917 revolution. And Lenin and his supporters did it in a rough way, if we talk about Russia. They were alienating parts of historical territories of Russia. And millions of people who lived there, obviously no one asked anything. Then before the Great Patriotic War and after it, Stalin added to the USSR and handed over to Ukraine some land that belonged to Poland and Hungary. And as a compensation, Stalin gave some ancient German lands to Poland. And in the 1960s, Khrushchev decided to take Crimea away from Russia and also gave it to Ukraine. That's how the territory of the Soviet Ukraine was formed. But now I would like to draw your attention to the initial stages of the establishment of the USSR. I think it's of utmost importance for us because we have to start from afar. I would like to remind you that after the October Revolution of 1917 and the civil war that followed, Bolsheviks started building a new state. And they had some differences among them. Stalin, who in 1922 was at the same time Secretary General of the Soviet Communist Party and People Commissar on the Merits of Ethnicities, decided to build the country on the principles of autonomy, thus giving to the republics, to the future administrative units, wide authority when they were supposed to join the state. Lenin criticized this plan and he suggested to make concessions to the nationalists, the way he called them back then advocates of independence. Basically, that was the idea about creating a confederation and give the right to every nation for self-determination. That was the basis of the Soviet state. First, in 1922, it was enshrined in the Declaration on the Establishment of the Soviet Union, and then, after the death of Lenin, it was also enshrined in the Constitution of the USSR of 1924. And right away, here we have a lot of questions. It raises a lot of questions. And first of them, and the main question, why were they making all kinds of concessions to the nationalists at the outskirts of the former empire, to give to the administrative units that were haphazardly formed huge territories, oftentimes that had nothing to do with them. And they were giving these territories with the population of historic Russia. And these administrative units were given status and shape of the state entities. 
And once again, this begs a question, why did they have to do such generous gifts even the most blatant nationalists couldn't dream of and at the same time give the Republic a right to withdraw from the new state without any preconditions? At first glance, it doesn't seem clear. It seems like madness, but only at first glance, because there is an explanation. After the revolution, the main goal Bolsheviks had was to keep power, to stay at power at any cost. And for this, they went to any length to sign humiliating conditions of the Brest truce when the Kaiser's Germany were in the dire economic situation and the outcome of the World War I was already almost decided and by giving any concessions to the nationalists inside the country. From the point of view of the historic destiny of Russia and its people, Lenin's principles of building the state weren't a mere mistake. That was much worse worse than a mere mistake. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, this has become absolutely obvious. Of course, what happened in the past cannot be changed, but at least we have to talk about it in honest and direct way, without any political agenda without giving any political color to it. I can only add that the ideas of the current political realities, no matter how beneficial they might seem currently, under no circumstances cannot and should not be a basis of the building a state. I'm not blaming anyone, accusing anyone of anything. The situation in the country back then and after the civil war and before the civil war was incredibly difficult, was critical. And now I only can say that that's how it happened. That's a fact, that's a historical fact. And as a result of Bolsheviks' policy, the Soviet Ukraine was created. And we have every reason to say now that it's Ukraine created by Vladimir Lenin. He's its creator and architect, and it's fully confirmed by the documents from the archives, also including the decrees, <coughs> Lenin's decrees regarding Donbass that was added to Ukraine. And now, grateful, the sentence demolishing all the statues, all the monuments to Lenin. They call it decommunization. You want decommunization? Well, we are quite happy with that. But don't stop halfway. We are ready to show you what would mean actual decommunization for Ukraine. Coming back to the history of the matter, I would like to remind you that back in 1922, at the territory of the former Russian Empire, the Soviet Union was established. But the reality showed that keeping this territory and ruling this territory using the principles of confederation seems impossible because it had nothing to do neither with the realities nor with the historical tradition. And the Red Terror and switch to the Stalin's purges and the monopoly of the Communist Party, nationalization, planned economy, all that in reality was turned into a formality, nothing more. Principles that were declared but didn't actually work. In reality, Soviet republics had no sovereign rights. None. In practice, what was created strictly centralized, unitarian in its character. State that was centralized. Stalin implemented not Lenin's ideas, but his own ideas of how state should be built. But changes to the founding acts, to the constitution, he didn't make any changes in this regard. Lenin's principles about building the Soviet Union were not reconsidered technically. It seemed there was no need in this. Under totalitarian regime, authoritarian regime, everything worked well, and it looked nice from the outside. It looked more than democratic even. But still, it's a shame. It's a shame that from the formal 
foundations our state was built on. They didn't clear out this odious new topic brought about by the revolution, but destructive fantasies. And in the future, how it often happened, no one thought about it. The leaders of the Communist Party seemed to be confident that they managed to build a strong governing system, that using this policy they managed to finally resolve the national issue, but replacing the notions, manipulating the public moods could cause dearly. The infection of nationalism did not disappear. And the bomb that was undermining the state with this infection of nationalism was just waiting for its hour to come. Because once again, any republic had the right to withdraw from the USSR. In the middle of 1980s, against the background of Raising problems, crisis of the planned economy, the nationalist issue that was caused not, some, not by some ideas of the Soviet peoples, but by growing appetites of the current leaders was escalated. But the USSR leadership, instead of analyzing the situation and making thoughtful decisions in the economy and in the political system, in the governing system, they were only talking about restoring Lenin's principles about national self-determination. More than that, inside the Communist Party there was a struggle for power in each side wanting to expand its support started to encourage this nationalism. They were trying to play with it. They are, we were promising anything to this nationalism. And when they talked about the democracy and bright future based either on the market economy or planned economy, but when in reality people were getting poorer and poorer, and the deficit got stronger, no one from the authority was thinking about tragic consequences. And then they went down well prodded path of satisfying the ambitions of nationalist elites that were raised inside the party. Because the Communist Party doesn't have these tools anymore, which is good. So they couldn't keep the power, and they couldn't use such tools as dictatorship or purges, and even the governing role of the party was diluted like a morning, like the folk in the morning in front of their eyes. And in September 1989, at the plenary session of the Communist Party, was made a fateful decision, the national policy of party under current conditions. So that, these are the stipulations it had. Soviet republics have all the rights to exercise their status of the sovereign Soviet republics. And the highest governing bodies can stop any decrease and any loss of the Soviet government in their territories. And finally, every Soviet republic has its citizenship that is given to all its citizens. Wasn't it obvious what will be the outcome of such decrees? Now it is not the time and the place to talk about the constitutional right or give definition of what citizenship is, but still it begs a question. Why in those difficult conditions they needed to make the situation even less stable? But the fact is still a fact. Two years before the Soviet Union collapsed, it was doomed. Now radicals and nationalists, including, and first of all, in Ukraine, they take the merit of winning independence. But we can see that that's not the truth. What happened to our country was caused by the mistakes done by the leadership of the Communist Party, made at different stages and at different types in times in their national and economical policies. The collapse of historical Russia named the USSR, was brought about by them. And despite all this, despite stealing from the people, our people agreed to the new realities that were brought about by the collapse of the USSR. They recognized new 
states, new republics, not only recognized. Back then, Russia was in dire situation, but it tried to help its partners from the CIS, including Ukrainian partners, because starting from the moment of proclaiming independence, they started making requests for the material support. And our country was giving this support with respect to the sovereignty of Ukraine. According to the estimates of the experts, that can be proved just by looking at the prices of our energy carriers, by our loans, our trade preferences that Russia was giving to Ukraine. The total profit for the Ukrainian budget since 1991 to 2013 was about $250 billion. But that's not all of it. By the end of 1991, the debt of the USSR in front of other states, an international fund was about 100 billion. And initially it was thought that these debts would be paid out by all the republics of the USSR in proportionate terms, in proportion with their economic potential. But Russia took the burden of paying out the entire Soviet debt and paid it out eventually. And we completed this process in 2017. And the other Soviet Republic had to renounce from the Soviet assets. And uh, this such agreement was signed in late 1994 with Ukraine. But Kiev didn't ratify this agreement, and later they refused to implement it. They were talking about golden reserves and about all kinds of assets of the former Soviet Union abroad. And still, despite the known problems, Russia has always cooperated and worked with Ukraine in an open and honest manner with respect to its interests. Our ties in all kinds of areas were developing. So in 2011, the trade turnover was more than $50 billion. And allow me to mention that the trade turnover of Ukraine with all the EU, EU countries in 2019 before the pandemic was smaller than that. And at the same time, it was not as well that the Ukrainian authorities preferred to act in such a way that to have all the rights and preferences in the relations with Russia, but to carry no obligations at the same time, assuming no obligations. So it wasn't really a partnership. They were just trying to get more from Russia, and sometimes it was it looked unceremoniously. For example, remember the blackmailing in the gas transit, stealing gas even. I would like to remind you that they were trying to use dialogue with Russia as a tool to blackmail the West. They said that they were, well, would get closer to Russia, trying to win preferences. They were saying that if not, the Russian presence in Ukraine will grow. And from the very first steps, they started building their statehood by renouncing everything that was bringing us together. They were trying to twist the historical memory of the generations of people who lived in Ukraine. So it comes as no surprise that the Ukrainian society faced the growth of the radical nationalism that became Russophobic and nationalist. That's why there are now Nazi and joining gangs in eastern Ukraine. The territorial claims against Russia were voiced more often. And the outer forces were also using their special services to raise there are people in Ukraine and to move them into power, into the government. Ukraine has never had stable traditions of their own statehood. Starting from 1991, they followed the path of the mechanical copying of foreign models that had nothing to do with their history or with the Ukrainian realities. Political and state institutions were changed to benefit the clans with their own interests that had nothing to do with the interests of the people of Ukraine. The whole idea of the so-called pro-Western civilizational choice of the Ukrainian democratic power was and is still not in creating better conditions for the good of the people, 
but to serve the geopolitical adversaries of Russia to save billions of dollars they stole from the Ukrainians and hidden by oligarchs in the, on the accounts in Western banks. Some financial groups who paid politicians first, they based on radicals and nationalists, others they were saying for good friendly relations with Russia, for cultural and language versatility, and they were coming to power using the votes of the people who really wanted to see it happen, including the people from the Southwest. But after they were assuming office, after getting high positions, they were betraying their people who elected them, their voters, and they followed their radical ideas in their policies. Sometimes they were even punishing people who wanted to cooperate with Russia, who wanted to keep both languages viable. And those people who supported them, of moderate views, who are used to trust the power, unlike radicals, they would never be aggressive to use unlawful means. But radicals were becoming more and more brazen, their claims were becoming bigger and bigger, so they had no problem to influence the weak power that was weakened by the virus of corruption. And they were replacing cultural, economic, social interests of the people, actual sovereignty of Ukraine by speculations on nationalist ground. The stable statehood hasn't been built in Ukraine. And the political electoral procedures serve just as a screen to divide power and assets between oligarch clans. Corruption that is a problem to a lot of countries, including Russia, in Ukraine has become a thing of its own. It's been corroding the entire system, all the branches of the state. And radicals used unhappiness of the people, fear and happiness. So they rode that wave and they turned Maidan in 2014 into coup d'etat. And they were backed by the foreign states. From the data that we have, the support of the so-called protest camp at the Independence Square in Kyiv from the U.S. Embassy was $1 million per day. And additionally, large amounts of money were transferred to the private accounts of the leaders of oppositions. Opposition, and we are talking about tens of millions of dollars. And how much did those who really suffered, those who died during the clashes at the squares and streets of the Kiev got? You better not know. You better not ask. Radicals who captured the power, they started terror against against those who were supporting constitutional law, against journalists, against politicians. They were humiliated pu publicly. The whole range of large-scale criminal cases covered Ukraine. We cannot but shudder when we remember about the situation in Odessa when people were burned alive when they protested the authorities. And those criminals who did this, they are not punished. No one is even looking for them. But we know their names, and we will do everything to punish them, to find them and to bring them to court of justice. Maidan didn't bring Ukraine closer to democracy. After perpetrating coup d'etat, nationalists and those political forces that backed them brought the situation to the deadlock. They pushed Ukraine into the chasm of civil war. And eight years later, the country is divided. It's going through dire economical crisis. According to the estimates of international organization, organizations in 2018, almost 6 million Ukrainians, which is almost 15 percent not of the able population, but of the entire population, had to move abroad looking for jobs. And as a rule, they were doing some basic work, unqualified work. And here is another fact. Starting 2020, 60,000 
doctors and other medical professionals left the country. Since 2014, the water prices increased by almost one-third. Energy prices increased manifold. Many people have no money to pay for the utility bills. They have to survive, literally. What happened? Why all this is happening? The answer is obvious, because things that they inherited from the Soviet Union, from the Russian Empire, was literally stolen, hidden in pockets. Hundreds of jobs were lost that were giving stable income to the people with the participation of the Russian Federation. Such areas as machine engineering, power industry, plane, aircraft manufacturing. They are either in crisis or destroyed. And the entire Soviet Union used to be proud of these industries in 2021. The shipbuilding factory in Nikolaev was closed. Famous Antonov conference starting from 2016, they haven't produced a single plane. And Yuzhmash factory that was building a space grade machinery, they are almost bankrupt. Same like the Kremenchuk steel factory. As for the gas transport system that was built by the entire Soviet Union, it has become so dilapidated that using it has a lot of risks. And in this regard, we have a question. This poverty, loss of the industrial and technological potential, is that the choice, the pro-Western choice that was put into the heads of the people for years now? Is that it? In reality, everything comes down to the fact that the collapse of the Ukrainian economy goes along with uh, robbing the Ukrainian people, and Ukraine itself is now being controlled from the outside. It is perpetrated not only by the instructions from the West, but also locally by a network of foreign consultants, NGOs and other institutions deployed in Ukraine. They have direct influence on all the important decisions at all the levels of government, from the central down to the municipal. It influences the main state corporations, Ukrainian railways, energy complex, Ukrainian post, administration of the seaports of Ukraine. And Ukraine doesn't have independent court system anymore. The Kiev authorities give, gave the preferential right to choose the members of the Supreme Legislation <coughs> Court bodies. And via its embassy in the U.S., the embassy of the U.S. directly controls the national agency on preventing corruption, national anti-corruption bureau, specialized anti-corruption district attorney office, an anti-corruption court. It's all done under the pretense to increase the efficiency of fighting corruption. Well, okay then, but where are the results? Because corruption is still there. It's even worse than it was. Do Ukrainians know about these choices? Do they understand that their country has become not even a protectorate, now it's a colony with puppets at its helm? The privatization of the state has led to the fact that the authorities that call themselves the authorities of patriots doesn't have interest of the nation, but otherwise they continue to assimilate Russian speakers by force. They are adopting more and more discriminatory decrees. Now they have a law on the native nations, those people who think, deem themselves Russian. They are let know that they do not belong in Ukraine. According to the laws on education and on Ukrainian language as a state language, Russian language is being thrown away from schools, from all public spaces, including shops. The so-called lustration law, cleansing of the power, allowed them to chase away public servants that they don't like. They adopt decrees that allow law enforcement to suppress the freedom of choice, the freedom of speech. We know the sad practice of unilateral illegitimate sanctions about other states, about the foreign 
individuals and legal entities. In Ukraine, they went even further than their Western partners. They came up with such an instrument as sanctions against their own citizens, entities, media outlets, even parliament members. In Kyiv, they are preparing decrees against the Russian Orthodox Church. And that's not an emotional estimate. We have certain documents. We have decisions that is talking about this. The split in church in Kyiv, they cynically turned into an instrument of national policy. The current leadership of the country does not react to the requests of the people to cancel the laws that undermine the rights of the believers. And now they have new laws adopted against the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And I would like to talk separately about Crimea. Population of the Crimea Peninsula made their choice to be with Russia. Ukrainian authorities have nothing to say against this. That's why they place their bets on aggression. They use cells of extremists, including the radical Islamic organizations. They are sending saboteurs to destroy vital infrastructure. They kidnap citizens of Russia. We have proof, we have evidence that such aggressive activities is perpetrated with the support of foreign special services. In March of 2021, Ukraine adopted new military strategy. This document almost completely aimed at confrontation with Russia. They want to drag foreign states into the conflict with our country. The strategy suggests to organize Russian Crimea and in Donbass, basically a terrorist underground. And it also outlines the possible war. And it is supposed to and the way the Ukrainian strategists now think with the support of international community on the beneficial conditions, beneficial for Ukraine. And also, as they say in Kyiv now, and I'm quoting also, just listen to it carefully with the military support of the world community and geopolitical confrontation against the Russian Federation. Basically, that's nothing but preparation for armed conflict against us, against Russia. We also heard statements about Ukraine wanting to create their own nuclear weapon. And that's not just idle threat. Ukraine really has nuclear technology and carriers to de deliver such weapons back from the Soviet times. And they have Tochka U launchers also designed in the Soviet Union. It has range of more than 100 kilometers, and they can increase that. It's a matter of time. They still have this technology from the Soviet times. So getting tactical nuclear weapon will be much easier for Ukraine than for certain other states. I'm not going to list them that are now researching this especially if they have technological support from abroad. And we can't exclude this. If Ukraine has a weapon of mass destruction, the situation in the world, in Europe, especially for us, for Russia, will change drastically. We cannot help but react to this real threat, especially since I would like to reiterate that the Western backers, they can help Ukraine with getting this weapon to create yet another threat for our country, because we can see how consistently they are pumping Ukraine with weapons. The United States alone, starting from 2014, transferred billions of dollars, including the arms supply training personnel. In recent months, Western weapons are sent to Ukraine ceaselessly in front of the eyes of the entire world. The activities of the Ukrainian army is governed by the foreign consultants, and we are well aware of that. Last year, under the pretext of the war games, the military contingents of the NATO countries were deployed in Ukraine. The the Ukrainian army is already integrated into NATO. It means that Ukrainian units, Ukrainian army units can be done directly from the NATO headquarters. The, the West started to explore the territory of Ukraine as the future theater of military action, at the future battlefield, and it is aimed against Russia. Last year alone, it had more than 20,000 troops and more than 1,000 
equipment, hardware units, and NAPFR, they have already adopted a law to allow the foreign troops to enter the territory of Ukraine to participate in the war games. And first of all, it means the NATO troops. And this year, they planned no less than 10 drills like that. And it serves as a cover to increase the NATO contingent in Ukraine, especially since the network of airfields, Borispol, Ivano Frankovsk, Chuguyev, Odessa, and so on, it can be used to deploy troops in shortest terms. The airspace for Ukraine is open for reconnaissance and strategic planes of NATO, unmanned drones that are used to, to monitor the territory of Russia. And the naval operations center built by the Americans in Ochakov allows NATO ships to use it as a port and allows to use high precision weapons against Black Sea Navy and our entire infrastructure on the Black Sea coast. Some time ago, the U.S. wanted to build such infrastructure in Crimea, but the population of Crimea and Sevastopol, they said, prefer no, and we will remember that. But now, this center has already been built and deployed in Ochakov. And I would like to remind you, in 18th century, Alexander Suvorov's soldiers fought for this city, and it's their bravery allowed it to add this city to Russia. Back then, in the 18th century, the Black Sea coast lands that were fought from, got from Turkey, from Osman, Ottoman Empire, was given name Novorossiya. Now they want to forget this name, like they want to forget the deeds of the famous commanders, without which Ukraine itself wouldn't have access to the Black Sea. Recently in Poltava, they demolished the monument to Alexander Suvorov. Well, what can I say? You are renouncing your own path, the so-called colonial legacy of the Soviet Empire. Well, be consistent then. <coughs> Article 17 of the Constitution of Ukraine doesn't allow military bases of foreign states to be deployed in their territory, but it seems that it can be bypassed. They have deployed training missions of the NATO countries in Ukraine. Basically, that's a military base already. They just call it a mission, and it's done. In Kyiv, they have long declared strategic aim at joining NATO. Yes, obviously, every country has the right to choose their own alliances to sign military agreements. That's true, but there is one. But in international law, it says the principle, there is a principle of indivisible security, which states that one country cannot enhance its security at the expense of security of others. And I can refer here to the European Security OAC Charter that was adopted in Istanbul in 1999 and Astana OSC Declaration from 2010. In other words, choosing means to enhance one's security should not create any threats for other states. And if Ukraine was to join NATO, it would serve as a direct threat to the security of Russia. And I would remind you, back in April of 2018 at the Bucharest summit of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, USA forced these members to make a decision that certain states were to join NATO. A lot of European allies already back then understood all the risks of such a step, but they had to subdue to the will of their older partner. Americans used them to pursue anti-Russian policy, skeptical about Ukraine joining NATO. And from some European capitals, we get a signal, they are saying, so what are you worrying about? It's not going to happen tomorrow. And now our American counterparts are saying the same. We say, okay, it is not going to happen tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow then, what will it change in historical context? Nothing. More than that, we know the stance and the statements of the U.S. leadership about the active confrontation military actions in the East of Ukraine would not stop Ukraine to join NATO if it will correspond to the criteria of the NATO Charter and if they can overcome corruption.
and they try to convince us that NATO is a peaceful and defensive bloc, so there is no threat for Russia, and they again suggest we believe their words, but we already know the value of such words. Back in 1990, when we talked about uniting Germany, the USA promised to the Soviet leadership that neither jurisdiction nor military presence would not move an inch to the east, and unification of Germany would not lead to the eastward expansion of NATO. And I'm quoting here, so they were saying all these things, they were giving us assurances, but these were just words later, they started saying that Central European and Eastern European countries joining NATO will improve their relations with Moscow, will read these countries from the fears of their difficult historical legacy, and more than that, it will allow them to create this belt of the friendly nations. But it was the other way around. These states are now bringing their stereotypes, their complexes of the Russian threat to NATO. They insisted on increasing potential of collective security that was supposed to be deployed against Russia, first of all. And it was happening back in the 1990s and early 2000s, when, because of the openness and good will, our good will, relations between Russia and the West were at high level. Russia fulfilled all its obligations. We threw troops from Germany, from the Central and Eastern European countries, and it made a huge contribution in overcoming the legacy of the Cold War. We consistently suggested all kinds of cooperation, including in the format of the Russian NATO Council and OSCE. More than that, I will say one thing that I have never said before in public. I will say it for the first time. Back in 2000, when President Bill Clinton was visiting Moscow at the end of his term, I asked him how would America see Russia joining NATO? I would not give you all the details of that conversation, but the reaction to my conversation looked, well, very reserved, let me put it this way. And how did Americans really look at this possibility? You can see it in their practical steps in regard to our country, open support of the terrorists in North Caucasus, ignoring our demands and our concerns in the security area, withdrawing from the treaties, arms treaties, and so on and so forth. It still begs the question, why? Why did they do that? What for? Okay, you don't want to see friend in us, an ally in us, but why do you want to make an enemy out of us? The only answer that we got was, it's not about our political regime or anything else, it's just they don't need such a big and independent country as Russia. So that's the answer to all the questions. That's the source of traditional American policy they pursue in the Russian track. That's why they react like this to all our proposals about security. You only need to look at the map to see how did the Western countries keep their word about non-expansion of NATO eastwards. They just lied to us. We had five waves of NATO expansion in 1999, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary were joint NATO in 2004, Bulgaria, Estonia, Lithuania, Slovakia, Romania and Slovenia in 2009, Albania and Croatia in 2017, Montenegro and 2020, North Macedonia. As a result, the alliance, its military infrastructure is drawn really close to the borders of Russia. That's one of the reasons, of the key reasons of the security crisis. It affected the entire system of international relations. The mutual trust was lost. The situation continues to get worse in strategic area as well. In Romania and in Poland, as part of the U.S. project, they deploy anti-missile defensive systems. We all know that the launchers deployed there can be used for cruise missiles Tomahawk that 
is a strike weapon, strike system. And USA is also developing Standard 6 missile. It can not only be used as an anti-missile defensive tool, it can strike at targets on land and on the sea. So they are expanding their infrastructure and they get new offensive capabilities. From the information that we get, we have every reason to believe that further deploying the sites, the facilities of North Atlantic Treaty Organization, this decision has already been made. That's just a matter of time. We understand clearly that under this scenario, the level of military threat for Russia will be increased manifold. I would like to draw your attention once again that there will be a bigger threat of immediate attack against our country. In American strategic documents, their doctrine, there is such a possibility of preventive work against the missile complexes of the adversary. And who is the main adversary of the United States? We all know that. Russia. In NATO documents, our country is officially directly called a main threat to the North Atlantic security. And Ukraine will serve as the platform for such an offense. If our ancestors heard about that, they would probably thought that it's impossible. We don't want to believe that either, but that's how it is now. I want people from Russia and Ukraine to understand that. Many Ukrainian airfields are positioned close to our borders, and strategic NATO airplanes using high-precision weapons can strike targets in Volgograd, Samar, and Kazan and Astrahan. Using reconnaissance tool will allow NATO to control the airspace of Russia up until the Urals. And finally, after the U.S. withdrew from the INF Treaty, the Pentagon has openly started developing a whole range of the land-based missiles with a range of 5,500 kilometers. If such systems are deployed in Ukraine, they can hit the targets in the European Russia and also behind the Euros. And the travel time of the Tomahawk missiles to Moscow will be less than 35 minutes. Ballistic missiles, 7-8 minutes. And the hypersound offensive weapons, 4-5 minutes. That's like having a knife against our throat. And I have no doubt they plan to implement these ideas. And as it has been done previously when they expanded NATO to the east, moving infrastructure, military infrastructure closer to our borders, ignoring our protests and our warnings, they just didn't care about that. They did whatever they deemed necessary and appropriate. And I believe they plan to continue doing like that. Because they see us as a dog barking at the caravan. We have never agreed to that, and we never will. Russia was always standing for resolving the most difficult issues at the negotiating table. Diplomatically, we understand our response a responsibility for global stability. Back in 2008, Russia has come up with an initiative on signing an agreement about European security. And its idea was, its gist was, that no state, no international organization and European Atlantic could not enhance its security at the expense of security of others. But our suggestion was refuted from the get-go because we can't allow Russia to limit the activities of NATO. We were told that legally binding guarantees of security only NATO members can have such guarantees. And last December, we have sent our partners the draft document about security guarantees and also the draft agreement on the measures of enhancing Russian security and NATO member security. In response, NATO members and the U.S. were saying a lot of words. There was some reasonable ideas, but they were talking only about secondary things, and it looked as an attempt to 
bring this discussion away from the main point and we reacted in kind. I would like to emphasize that we are ready to negotiate, but only on the condition that all matters will be considered as a package in complex without going away from the main proposals made by Russia. And those have three main items. Firstly, non-expansion of NATO to the east, non-deployment of offensive weapons next to the Russian borders, and finally, bringing back the military infrastructure back to the Confederation of 1997 when the founding act was signed between Russia and NATO. These principled proposals were ignored. Our Western partners, once again, they were saying the same old words that every state has freedom to choose ways to enhance its security, to provide its security to join any military alliances. So nothing changed in their position. They talk about the same open doors policy. More than that, once again, they try to blackmail us. Once again, they threaten us with sanctions. And I think they will still impose those, introduce those as strong and as more powerful our country becomes. We will always find an excuse to introduce more sanctions, regardless of the situation in Ukraine, that is. The only goal they have is to contain the development of Russia. And they will do that like they did it before, without any formal excuse, only because we exist. And we will never concede our sovereignty, our national interest, and our values. And I want to be frank. In the current situation, when our proposals about equitable dialogue, about principled matters, had no response from the US and NATO, when the level of threat for our country is becoming greater and greater, Russia has every right to take countermeasures to enhance our own security. And that's how we plan to act. As for the situation in Donbass, we can see that the Kyiv elite keeps stating publicly about lack of willingness to implement the Minsk agreements to settle the conflict. They are not interested in peaceful resolution. Vice versa, they want to start Blitzkrieg like it happened back in 2014 and 2015. And you remember what those, how it ended. Now almost every day they are shelling settlements in Donbass. They have amassed large troops. They are using offensive unmanned vehicles and other heavy machinery, torturing people, children women, elderly people, it doesn't stop, it doesn't cease. We see no end to it. And the so-called civilized world, and our Western colleagues proclaim themselves as the only representatives of this free world. They prefer not to notice this, as if there is nothing like this happening. There is no genocide perpetuated against 14 million people. And the only reason is that these people didn't want to back the coup d'etat in 2014. They stood against the nationalist movement, the movement towards nationalism, Stone Age nationalism and Nazism, and they want to defend their basic rights, to live on their land, to speak their native language, to preserve their traditions and their culture. How much longer that could go on? How much longer can they bear it? Russia did everything it could to keep the territorial integrity of Ukraine. We tried hard to implement the resolution of the Security Council of UN 2202 that endorsed the Minsk agreements on 
resolving the situation in Donbass. But everything was done in vain. The presidents are changing, the parliament members are changing, but the idea of the aggressive regime is still the same. Regime that seized the power in Kyiv. It was created by the coup d'etat of 2014. And those who chose the way of violence, they admit they see no other way to resolve the Donbas crisis other than the military way. In this regard, I deem it necessary to make a decision that should have been made a long time ago, to immediately recognize the independence and sovereignty of Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic. And I would like to in request the Federal Assembly to support, to back this decision and ratify the agreement of friendship and mutual help with both republics. We will draft this document and sign these documents in the near future. And those who seize the power and keep the power in Kyiv, we demand to stop hostilities immediately. Otherwise, all the responsibility for the possible continuation of the bloodbath will be on the consciousness of the regime that is ruling in Kyiv. By declaring these decisions, I'm confident that I will have support of the people of Russia, all the patriotic forces of Russia. Thank you for your attention. We start the ceremony of signing the documents. President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, is signing the executive decree on recognition of the Donetsk People's Republic. President of the Russian Federation, Mr. Vladimir Putin, signing the executive decree on recognition of the Lugansk People's Republic.